Good morning. It's so good to see you all here at worship at First Baptist Church of Middlesboro. We are so glad that you are here, whether you are uh, a member or a guest. Uh, we welcome you to worship this morning. If you are a guest, if you would, uh, if you would tear off the tab that's on your worship folder and fill that out and put it in the offering plate when it comes around a little bit later in the service, that'll help us have a better record of your visit. Uh, we have a guest with us this morning, Dr. Wade Rowett, is going to be preaching this morning and is going to be leading in several uh, sessions this afternoon that are about family care and caring for our families. Uh, Wade has served as a director of the St. Matthew's Pastoral Counseling Center in Louisville. Uh, he uh, has been a professor at Southern Seminary and is currently a uh, professor at Baptist Seminary of Kentucky. Uh, Wade has uh, authored uh, 10 books, more than 50 articles, and has led hundreds of workshops, uh, along with Jody, his wife, uh, in, in numerous areas dealing with families. And we are very fortunate to have him here this morning to lead us in worship and also this afternoon and look forward to that time together. I want to uh, make a couple of announcements before we um, continue with worship. Uh, this afternoon we will have those workshops. E even if you haven't signed up yet, come this afternoon. Four o'clock uh, will be our, the first session, and that will be in here in the sanctuary. At 5.30 we'll go down and have uh, a quick meal in the fellowship hall. And then at 6 o'clock we'll have our second session, uh, Caring for Aging Loved Ones. Um, the children through sixth grade will have activities in the children's area and pizza, and they're going to have a good time down there. Uh, this Wednesday, we'll have a business meeting, um, and the following Wednesday, the 22nd, we'll, we will have our uh, annual Ash Wednesday service. Ne that next Wednesday begins the season of Lent, that time leading up to, uh, to Easter Lent's a time of preparation, of preparing for uh, the Easter event. And I hope that you will mark your calendar and be present for the Ash Wednesday service on February the 22nd. There are numerous other dates uh, to be aware of. Make sure and mark those on your calendars. But let's stand and greet each other as we prepare to worship God. Let's begin worship singing our praise. Hymn number 17, This is My Father's World, as we stand together.
hearts and minds together as we pray. Our God of light and love, our giver of life and breath, from the restless movement of our everyday lives, help us find our way back to rest and renewal this morning. From the quickened pace of our going and coming, help us find our way into the rhythms of your peace and presence with us. And from the constant ongoing calendar we maintain, help us find release this morning, even if just for this hour. God, for this time of worship and for this week ahead, open our hearts to welcome your presence, open our ears to hear you speak in gentle whispers, open our eyes to see you at work among us, open our minds to your guidance as we read and reflect upon scripture, and open our hands to welcome others in the love of Jesus Christ. May the choruses sung with our lips, the words we hear with our ears, the feelings that stir in our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. For we pray in the name of the one who redeems us even now, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Take your hymnals once again and turn to 683, our responsive reading today about family. Who is our family? We are family by heritage, by community, by humanity. Who is our sister? Who is our brother? We are brothers and sisters of all for whom Christ died. Who is our child? We are the parents of all children who need care and love and protection. Who is our parent? We are the children responsible for all the elderly, who are vulnerable, weak, and lonely. By the grace of God, we will embrace and nurture our family.
Sometimes it feels like we spend most of our life somewhere in between I need thee and where are you? I think that's where the people of God were, the Israelites, when, when they were scattered in exile. Where are you, God? We need you. Hear these words from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, beginning with verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my God is disregard my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary, his understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and grow weary, and young men will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let's pray together. Emmanuel, most holy one, creator God. In the beginning, when you looked out on the works of your hand, you saw it and you called it good. What an affirmation! What an encouragement! The waters, the trees, the sky, the, the heavenly bodies, birds and beasts, even us, humankind. Good. And that you desire relationship with us. That is good. Yet there are those of us in these moments, in this time, there are those who cannot see, who cannot hear, who cannot speak, who cannot call life good. Perhaps it is because death's sting still lingers. The dirt is still on our shoes from standing by the graveside. For some of us, the smell of hospital halls and bedsides still lingers. There are those who are drowning in schedules and work and school. There are those who sit in the midst of broken families trying to put together the pieces. There are those who have lost jobs, who are hungry for work, for ways to support their families. There are those caught up in the chains of addiction. There are so many who cannot call life good. God, we carry anger and frustration and hurt, depression, worry, anxiety. We see images of tragedy, of loss of life, of people taking advantage of others. God, there are so many ways that we ask each day, where are you, O oh God? When will peace come? When can we find rest? When will we have enough strength? 
Oh, Abba, Father, we are here. Our hearts are tired. Our eyes grow weary. We need to experience you. Then comes your presence, sanctuary. Then comes your eyes, hope. Then comes your strength, rest. Then comes your people, family. And then comes your word. It is good. As we worship together this morning, may your unending, undying love indwell us. May you teach us once again of your presence in our lives and the ways that you are trying to nurture us God, nourish our souls this morning as we sing, as we listen, as we sit next to each other. Strengthen us. Give us what we need for the journey ahead. God, remind us this morning of your presence with us as we lift our voices together and pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is a kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, all of our children are invited to the front for children's time. Well, good morning. Does anyone know what is coming up on Tuesday? Tuesday. Valentine's Day. February 14th, Valentine's Day. Does anyone plan to give any Valentine's out, maybe to friends or family member? I am at my class. You are at your class? Yeah. Me too. All right. Wonderful. You know, it's one way that we can show the people that we care about how much we care about them, how much we love them, whether it's friends at school or family members at home. It's a good day to tell those around us that we love them, that we care about them. Have you ever stopped to think about how much God loves you? What if God could send us a valentine? I wonder what that would say. I brought a story with me today that I want to share with you, and it's about how much God loves us. It call, it's called, God Loves Me More Than That. How much, does God, how much love does God have for me? More than the letters between A and Z. More than the bumbles in a bumblebee, God loves me more than that. Tell me, please, is the Lord's love high, higher than the moon in a starless sky? Higher than a space shuttle flying by, God loves me higher than that. Just how deep is God's love for me? Deeper than a treasure chest beneath the sea. Deeper than a wishing well could ever be, God loves me deeper than that. Tell me, please, is the Lord's love wide, wider than a semi-truck from side to side? Wider than prairies where cowboys ride, God loves me wider than that. Just how much does the Lord's love weigh? More than elephants 
munching hay. More than hippos on a rainy day, God's, God loves me bigger than that. Tell me, please, is the Lord's love loud, louder than the cheering of a football crowd? Louder than the thundering, rumbling, storm-charged cloud, God loves me louder than that. Is God's love soft, won't you tell me please, softer than the sigh of a summer breeze? Much, much softer than a kitten's sneeze, God loves me softer than that. Lord, it's great to be loved by you, hope you know that I love you too. Nice to know that my whole life through, God loves me more than that. God's love for us is high and long and wide and deep and soft and loud. God loves us so much. Let's pray and thank God for that. God, we thank you for your love for us. And we thank you for this opportunity this week to tell those around us how much we love them. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn of stewardship is number 687 in your hymnals. Would you bless our homes and families? And we'll sing together as we stand.
Thank you, choir. Thank you to your church and congregation for permitting me this opportunity to be with you. I grew up in a small town in southern Illinois, a small mining town, and about 300 miles from Chicago. And although it's 200 miles from where I live in Louisville uh, to Middlesbrough, uh, I feel like I'm coming back home. Uh, I feel like uh, when, I, when I drove into town and, and, and saw the malls and the, uh, and the Walmart, uh, it felt like home uh, again to me. Even in southern Illinois, we, we have the knobs and the hills not quite as pronounced as here. Um, it's good uh, to be with you. And I appreciate the opportunity of your inviting me uh, to come and be with you. It's my privilege, and I, I, I don't take it lightly. I, I've spent my life uh, since I left computing engineering and uh, engineering uh, and went to seminary trying to look at what makes Christian families Christian and how can we build Christian families. By definition... Um, I'm talking about our relationships, actually. Our Christian family might, might be father, mother, and two children. It's more likely uh, for most of us that our family includes uh, in-laws, outlaws, um, relatives, friends, people who live next door. Some of my dearest family members are the elderly couple who live next door to me and have no children in town. And uh, I realize that elderly is a relative because now the people across the street are checking on me every time it snows <laughs> instead of me checking on them. Um, Ephesians, the fifth chapter, contains a section of Paul's writing that is often referred as the household cold. And there's much uh, confusion about this passage that results from how we break up the verses and in the original Greek, there were no breaking up of verses. It was all there. So I'm going to begin uh, with uh, verse 21, which is the end of a section of what it means to be a mature Christian. Uh, things like don't be foolish, don't get drunk with wine, uh, be filled with, with the Spirit, don't speak loosely uh, one to another, but speak with spiritual song. Always giving thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. And that could be the end of that section. But verse 21, where we begin today, says, And be subject to one another in reverence for Christ. And be subject to one another in reverence for Christ. Then it goes on to say, Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. When we take that one out of context, we create all kinds of anti-women equality in our churches and in our congregations. As some of you I have known for years, from back when I was teaching at Southern Seminary in Louisville. I was one of 29 professors given the opportunity to resign rather than to be fired because I supported ordination of women and had many women chaplains and uh, many women uh, students uh, in my years. And uh, it took my wife and I about five minutes to decide that we couldn't turn our back on our commitments and that we would uh, go look for something else uh, to do. Um, but if we take verse 21 uh, as our thesis sentence, those of you who remember back in English you had a thesis sentence, then you had subpoints. that's what Paul does here, thesis sentence. Be subject one to another in reverence for Christ. Wives to your husbands, as the church is to Christ. But husbands... The hammer falls on verse 25. Men, it says that husbands are to love our wives as Christ loved the church and died for her and gave himself up for her. And then the rest of the, this uh, chapter talks about the commitment of husbands, uh, how we ought to love our wives as we love our own body. He who loves his wife loves himself for no one hates his flesh but nourishes and cherishes it as Christ does the church. We have the, we have the major responsibility for commitment and sacrifice if we take this. If anyone's subject, it's, it's the husband's. Would we dare say that the church has outgiven Christ? No. We are to sacrifice for our families as Christ did the church. 
my own personal social view is that part of the decline of the family in American society is the lack of commitment on the part of men. It's the lack of commitment to our families and to our relationships. We are, we are committed to, to many other things. Uh, Paul continues, point two, husbands and wives, point one, point two, children and parents. Uh, we might expand this to talk about what do we do across the generation. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. But the reciprocal nature comes back. And fathers, parents, do not provoke your children to anger but rather bring them up in instruction and discipline of the Lord. Fathers and mothers, can we say that we have always so gently and kindly, in commitment, disciplined our children in a way not to make them angry? And then it talks about the larger family, the family of God, our churches, in verses 5 through 9 as it talks about even masters and slaves. It's point 3 under his thesis sentence, be submitted one to another. Even masters and slaves ought to have this type of mutual commitment to each other. Mutual commitment to each other. I'm going to suggest to you that the cost of the Christian family is so high Although most of us long and pant for a Christian family, for Christian relationships, to live in a Christian community, to have the peace and the love of God in our church, that we simply aren't willing to pay the price. It costs too much on our part. Now I'm willing for you and you and you and you and the choir to pay the price, but I would like a bargain myself. I'd like a little more blessing than, than I have to put in. I, I, I would like a little more investment. I want to get on the ground floor of some stock option where I put in just a couple hundred dollars and become a millionaire when it comes to relationships. Uh, I would like my family to put me at the center and they, they live around me. Uh, most, most of us kind of secretly have a little bit too much ego to really be good family members. The cost of a Christian family, three things. Number one comes from this passage, Christ-like commitment to each other a christ-like commitment that says i'm going to put you before me when the going gets tough now many of you do this uh, many of you have already lived lives sacrificing for your children for your children's education when the food came to the table if you were in short times you pretended you weren't very hungry uh so, some of you uh, gave time and energy that your family will never know about. And I, I suspect, uh, Pastor, that this church has some members like that. You, you have some behind the scene members who are taking care of things, who are making things happen, who are committed and sacrificing. That's what it takes to have a Christian family. And the same, the same in your community. You, you need community leaders. You need people to step up to create children's programs, to create youth recreation programs, to create opportunities for children's choir and children's essays in school. You need some people to step up and be committed for these things to happen. If you want that kind of community, that kind of church, that kind of family, the first price that we pay is a Christ-like commitment to each other. Uh, I, as I often do when I go into a new community, picked up a newspaper. And uh, read through Saturday's paper uh, for you. I don't know, uh, is it Al Early, who writes a column uh, in, in the Saturday paper? Is he a regular? Or, in, anyway, uh, he wrote an article reviewing a book by uh, Dr. Emerson Eggs, Egg Riches. Uh, that's, that's an interesting name. In E-G-G-S-R-I-C-H-S, Egg Riches. Um, and he had done some uh, research on the difference of men and women and our expectation and our longing and desire in our family. And we want different things. 70% of the women didn't care if their husband respected them or not, if he loved them. If he loved them. 70% of the men said they were not as concerned of whether or not their wife loved them or not, if she respected them. If she now, he says that a lot of our 
squabbles in the family could be settled if we just realized those differences. Uh, by the way, I would suggest that we stand at a good time to express our commitment on Tuesday. Send a lot of Valentines. Make some Valentines. Send some Valentines to some people in this congregation uh, who maybe like my wife and I are the only two relatives we have in the state of Kentucky. Uh, when, when we see children and grandchildren at church, our heart aches because ours are in Waco, Texas, and Kansas City, Kansas, and soon to be Nashville, Tennessee. Find some people who aren't as connected with biological family and send, send them a valentine or, or go up and shake their hand and, and, and tell them what they mean to you. But also find some people or find a way at Valentine's Day to say to the people that you've respected from a distance. Do you know I respect you? I've noticed what you do. I've noticed that in our business meetings, you, you bring a Christian way of looking at things. You, you, you bring a peaceful way. You bring a sanity. You bring insight. You bring knowledge. Whatever it is you bring. Or I, I've noticed that around our church, you're the person who, who doesn't mind cleaning up. And I respect you for that. Take it as a time to, to give some respect and to voice your commitment uh, to each other. Well, Christ-like commitment in our relationships is the first cost of Christian marriage. The second cost I'm going to suggest we would find by taking uh, Matthew uh, 16, verses 24 and 25 a little more seriously. Those who try to find themselves will lose themselves, but those who lose themselves for Christ's sake will surely find themselves, will surely find themselves. Uh, we live in a society of narcissists. You remember the Greek mythology, narcissism sees his reflection and falls in love with his own reflection. Uh, the trouble with some marriages is that we're both in love with the same person, me. And uh, we live for the same person, me. We lack that kind of commitment. The trouble with some families is as a family, we are selfish. We expect to get the first at church. We expect the recognition with minimum commitment. We expect at school that our kids will be favorites. We expect in business we'll get the breaks. We expect to go to the front of the line and have people serve us. Because after all, a... a, a and a little bit of a secret that I know that you don't know, I'm the center of the universe. I, I'm, all that, I'm all that matters. I'm what counts. My friend, Dr. Ed Thornton, who taught psychology and religion with me for a number of years, said that the one thing the Christian faith and the Jewish faith have tried to teach is discipline of our ego. That we don't live for ourselves, folks. If we do, we wind up like our... Pop idols. Can you, can you imagine having to suffer like Michael Jackson suffered when he finally got to be the center of what he wanted to be the center of? If, I don't care if you're climbing the entertainment ladder, the, if you're climbing the athletic ladder, if you're climbing the, the ladder of business success, educational success, wherever it is, when you get there, you're going to find out it's not the meaning of life. Those who try to find themselves by climbing ladders are surely going to lose themselves. Most of us even have our ladder on the wrong wall anyway. We're, we're just, we're just in, in trouble and, and don't know it. We, we are spending our time and energy. We, we are spending our resources and our lives chasing after the wrong things. Those who want to find themselves must lose themselves, not for any reason, but for the same reason we make a commitment to each other in reverence for Christ. If Christ is central in our lives, then we make the commitment to each other and we make the commitment to all others. If we want to have Christian families and Christian relationships, then we lose ourselves for Christ's sake. We lose ourselves serving others, not... not so it'll help our business grow, so it'll help, help us look better, but for Christ's sake. We bring the cup of cold water. We visit the sick. We even visit those in prison. We, we go, go to those in need, and we remember to say, in Christ's name.
I come to you as a representative of Christ. And we are reminded in Matthew 25, inasmuch as you do it unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. Wouldn't it be a privilege if you went home today and there sits Jesus, maybe just like the artist rendered Jesus, sets Jesus in your home and said, I'm hungry, will you cook me a meal? Oh my gracious, us old guys who don't even know how to cook very well would run into the kitchen and look for some instant mac and cheese or something. I mean, we, we would get busy with the best we could do, wouldn't we? And those of you who are, who are fine uh, cooks would get out there and, uh, do, do they have stack cakes down here? I was over in Barberville, they, they had stack cakes. They, they, I, I did a week-long thing, so Wednesday night they brought me some. You would even fix stack cakes uh, for, for Jesus that day. I mean, you, you would make it up right, wouldn't you? Well, I'm telling you, when every person comes in your presence, there's Jesus. When, when a hungry person in this community is walking down the road, there's Jesus. Inasmuch as you've done it into the least of these. The second cost of a Christian family is a Christ-centered calling. A Christ-centered calling. Now, I don't know Sharon Smith from here in Middlesbrough. Does anybody here know her? She's a nurse, apparently. Uh, she was on the front page of the paper uh, because she has volunteered to go with some Harvard doctors and, and Mass General Hospital, which, by the way, are some of the better hospitals in the nation, uh, to do missions in Kenya. Uh, they called her. They didn't have a nurse anesthetist. And she had four days notice, bought her tickets, and took off. I hope you would live with that kind of Christ-centered calling. When there's a tap on the shoulder, the pastor calls, the nominating committee calls, the choir calls. They're not going to call me, but the choir calls and says, we need you. Your first response would be yes, because you would be losing yourself for Christ's sake. Now, some of us know the danger of living that way in a church that doesn't have enough other people living that way. We get overextended, burned out, used up. We're on 15 different committees. Uh, we're expected to be there all, all the time. And it's just, it's just tough, isn't it? Have you heard the little poem, Mary had a little lamb, it would have been a sheep? Till it joined a Baptist church and died from lack of sleep. And, and that, that can happen to any of us. That can happen to any of us. Uh, where do we get the energy... And where do we get the psychological energy to put our ego second time and time and time again? And not like Noah feels sorry for ourselves sitting by a gourd vine, uh, feeling sorry for ourselves because uh, we're, we didn't get back from God what, what we intended. Where do we get the energy to commit ourselves to each other endlessly? Where do we get the energy to live for Christ's sake. I did a survey. I'm on a couple of journal boards. And we did an article on stress in the clergy family. Female clergy, male clergy, what goes on. You know, loneliness, overextended, live in a fishbowl. People expect me to get up in the middle of the night and go get their umbrella and bring it to them because it's raining and they left it at church. And just all these kind of demands kind of stuff. I found, found out something. I also asked them, what keeps you going? Uh, one of my old country friends said, you have to know what fills your bucket. What, what fills your bucket? What, 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 keep, what keeps you going? The number one thing that the 200 pastors that responded to my survey, pastors and chaplains and associate pastors, so the 200 ministers who responded, the number one thing was my relationship with God. Number two was seeing the people of God grow. Losing myself for Christ's sake and seeing transformation happen, seeing the people of God grow. Well, as Matt read for you in Isaiah, the whole nation of Israel was in such a burnout place. They were in a place where they were, they were ready for retirement. They, they, were, they were ready to put it up on the shelf and say, I'm going to retire. Now, when I talk, to the, uh, talk about caring for aging persons uh, tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about there's no such thing as retirement. You still have 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You may not be being paid, but you still have to make meaningful use of your time. You still have to make meaningful use of your time. 
Our, our country needs to make meaningful use of their existence. Your church needs to make meaningful use of who you are. And if you're going to do that by serving others, you're going to run out of gas. You're going to be out of energy. And you're going to be like the nation Israel crying out, God, where are you? Well, I remind you the words of the prophet. Have you not heard? D didn't you know, folks, the prophet would say? God doesn't grow weary. The energy of God doesn't run out. Christ isn't bankrupt. God gives strength to the weary. And to those who lack strength, God increases their power. Youth will grow weary and tired. Vigorous young men will stumble badly, but those who wait upon the Lord, those who find their strength in God, will gain new strength. And then the passage that's been captured by so many photographers and artists, we will mount up like an eagle, with wings as an eagle, catching the power of God to sustain us, not our own power. We'll run and not get tired We'll walk and not be weary. Well, as I turn to your newspaper, uh, Ronnie McBrayer had a column uh, that talked about uh, the difficulty in finding inner peace. Now, I don't know him. But do you all know him? I apparently, some, some of this, you know. He claims to be ADD. Now, those of us who are ADD have trouble with those of you who enjoy your quiet time. I mean, when I sit down for quiet time, I say, remember that squirrel? You know, look, look over there. You know, it, sometimes it's hard for me to get through the Lord's Prayer without remembering that I didn't do something. Uh, it's, it's just really, really difficult. What I'm asking you to do, if you want to have a Christian family, is pay the price of being Christ-centered and God-centered. You have to spend time and energy drawing upon the power of God. Prayer, Bible study, singing. But for me, I, I, I sometimes just can't sit down and do that. So I do it walking through the woods. I, I, I do it walking down a trail. Sometimes, I think I'd make a good Catholic. If I had my rosary to, to, to twitch, twitch like this, it'd take care of it, and then my brain could focus on what I'm trying, what I'm trying to uh, pray, pray about. Uh, whoever you are, we're not asking that your personality suddenly become that of a monk. Maybe you can't handle solitude. However you live and however you approach God, if you want a Christian family, if you want a Christian family of God, if you want a Christian community in a, the wider world, in addition to your commitments to each other, in addition to your finding a calling and finding a purpose, you have to stay centered in God in your faith. Now, I have disappointing news for you. You can look throughout your uh, newspaper. Uh, you, you can run up and down the internet uh, looking at Groupons or wherever you look for bargains. You will not find a bargain on this one. There are no shortcuts to Christian maturity. There are, there are no shortcuts to being a woman of God or a man of God, to having a Christian family. And as I started, I would end up and say most of us who are disappointed in what we don't have aren't necessarily paying the price. So I, I invite you at this time to reflect on your own life. If you're a 10-year-old, a 50-year-old, an 80-year-old, or a Somewhere on either side of that or in between. Ask yourself, am I committed to my family? Am I committed to my family, to the, to the people that I live with? Uh, ask yourself, are we, are we living for ourselves so we, so, we, so we can buy new furniture, so we can have a, a bigger, better car? So, we, so are, are we living for the wrong things? Or do we have a calling? Do we have a mission that we're, we're about here? And then ask yourselves, do I spend the time I need to spend with God? If you're not making those sacrifices, if you're not paying the cost, you're probably not going to reap the benefits. 
It's kind of like if we were going to construct a ship to cross the ocean. Our commitment to each other is the binding that holds the whole together. Our sense of calling is like the North Star. It gives us direction when we have to make decisions. What am I going to do with this money? What am I going to do with my time? What am I going to do with my energy? I'm going to do what my number one priority is, my calling. And then we get that ship floating. We get a sense of direction. How are we going to get it there? Some of us want to try to paddle the ship across the ocean. It doesn't work. Our own power won't do it. We lift our lives as a sacrifice before God. And we catch the breath of God as a sail catches the wind. And we are empowered into the future. Any good salesman knows that the end of the sale comes with the ask. Are you going to buy this car? You want this refrigerator? Can you see this flat screen in your home? Well, I'm going to ask you right now, can you see Christ in your commitments in your calling, and in your time of devotion. If, when we sang our hymn of invitation, if you feel you need to make a commitment, that husband or wife or child or grandchild or grandparent or friend sitting next to you, just reach out and take their hand and say, you know, I, I want to be there for you. I, I want to use this Valentine's Day or th this day as a time to renew my commitment to you and, and to say so. If you need to pray together about a call, a mission, a direction, where does God want to use you, call the pastor, uh, call, call the nominating committee and say, where can I be of service in this church? I'm sure they'll find a, they'll find a place uh, for you there. Maybe you need to make a decision to spend more time and renew your life. Maybe, maybe you want to come forward and say to the pastor, I want to spend more time in prayer and Bible study. I want to renew my commitment to Christ. Some of you may want to, to say, I've been thinking about full-time Christian service. You can come and do that. And if there are those present who have not made a commitment to Christ and you're not a Christian, we invite you to come and take that first step and accept Christ as your personal Savior. Your pastor will be here with you as we sing together hymn number 246, The Church's One Foundation. Won't you come? challenging us this morning, for offering us words uh, of direction, but also encouragement that we have what it takes to be Christian families, to be Christian community, to be a Christ-like church in this place. And that happens because, brothers and sisters, Christ is in you. Christ goes before you and behind you. Christ is to your left and to your right, Christ undergirds you, is in the words that you speak and the presence that you offer. Go and walk that difficult road of being Christ to the people that you meet. Amen and amen.